Welcome to This Week in South Carolina. I'm Gavin Jackson. Winthrop University political science professor Scott Huffman gives us insight on the results from several key races across the country this past week and what they mean for the 2022 midterms. But first, we talk with politics reporter Joe Bustos of the state newspaper about big local races in the first in the South Republican Action Convention. Joe, welcome to This Week in South Carolina. Thanks for having me. So, Joe, I want to talk to you about a couple different things. It's been a busy week here in South Carolina. Obviously, we had some uh, municipal elections going on across the state. We also had the first in the South Republican Action Convention that you attended. A lot of people attended in Myrtle Beach, as well as we're about a year away from the midterms. So a lot going on here. I want to catch up with you about. But first, I want to focus on Columbia, the mayor's race here. Uh, it's probably one of the bigger races to follow in this state. Uh, we're talking about uh, a couple candidates who are vying to replace outgoing Mayor Steve Benjamin, who's been leading the city for 11 years. Uh, what did you see in that race? What happened? What, what's the state of that play in that race right now? So there are four candidates who are in the um, <clears throat> the uh, mayor race. Um, only no one got 50 percent of the vote. So Tamika Isaac Devine, uh, council member, and another council member, Dan Rickleman, they are going off to going into a runoff. Uh, Rickman got uh, 44% or he got the most votes in, in the race. Uh, one popular person who, uh, who may be uh, in the city is Sam Johnson, the former chief of staff to Mayor Benjamin. He came in third, but he got uh, maybe about 23% uh, of, of the vote. And that's going to be the who who do his supporters go to? Mm -hmm. uh, do they go behind Isaac, uh, Tamika Isaac Devine or do they go towards Dan Rickman? That's going to be the interesting part of the next couple of weeks when we have the, the runoff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, two weeks until that runoff, and, and like you said, that split vote there too. Uh, but and we've seen a lot of pushback too from the SCGOP, a lot of outside groups also really going after uh, Councilwoman Devine there too. Uh, so I'm guessing that's the bigger threat here, especially in a pretty democratic city. Yeah, and it was uh, to me. Uh, Isaac Devine has been pushing back against all those allegations that have been put in some of those flyers that have been sent out. Uh, I think her biggest point is she she says she's never been charged with any kind of ethics violation. Mm -hmm. She uh, stands by her record. Um, now the question is, how much does that resonate uh, in the next couple of weeks? Do people uh, still trust her at the end of the day? Uh, did that uh, GOP messaging uh, have any effect on the electorate uh, in two weeks? Mm -hmm. Yeah, runoff elections, already pretty low turnout for the election itself, not only here in Columbia, but across the state, just a lot of municipal elections going on. And obviously it's going to be even smaller turnout come two weeks, so we'll be watching that race too. But let's move to the Grand Strand, Joe, where we saw some interesting action. We saw um, a mayor's race out there in Myrtle Beach, and then also some Georgetown City Council action that I know the South Carolina Republican Party is really happy about. Uh, what did we see happen on the coast? So Brenda Bethune, the mayor of Myrtle Beach, she won a re-election campaign. Uh, she had four challengers, mm. uh, and she still got a majority of the vote. So uh, this person who came in second place was a photographer who worked for President Trump, uh, Gene Ho. He was also someone who pushed QAnon theories, uh, conspiracy theories. And Brenda Bethune still got a majority uh, of the vote in an area that's increasingly, increasingly Republican. Mm -hmm. And then there's a Georgetown City Council. It was a 43 split uh a Democratic split uh, before the election. After the election, uh, it became a five t a five to two uh, a Republican advantage on that city council. So there's been some trends in that area, and the Republicans have taken advantage of it. Yeah, it seems like they were pretty pretty pumped too because they've never had such power in, in Georgetown City Council either. Even though it sounds like they're trying to move that city council to become a nonpartisan uh, situation as well. Yeah, and, and that's that. Even if it's nonpartisan. Uh, uh, city council, you're always going to have people leaning in one way or the other. So people will know mm -hmm. what direction some city council members lean. So uh, they they may, may they may call it nonpartisan, but you always have an idea where people stand on some of these, mm -hmm. these issues. Yeah, so Myrtle Beach, Horry County, then Georgetown County, some big battlegrounds. We saw a lot of activity over there this weekend as well. Uh, you were there too at the, the first in the South Republican Action Convention. Uh, that took place this weekend. It's meant to attract a lot of top billions, a lot of big names in the Republican Party. Uh, at one point, even President Donald Trump's name was floated to attend that. Uh, a lot of other different people were, were named. Uh, but it's basically the inaugural CPAC of South Carolina is what the, the whole billing was there. Kind of what did you hear at that at that gathering, Joe? And, and who was there? What were some of the big names that actually ended up attending? It was a lot of red meat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so a lot of red meat was thrown out there to the uh, party loyalists, people who... Uh, who volunteer, who fundraise, who door knock for candidates. Now, uh, we had some big names. We had Rick, Senator Rick Scott from Florida. Uh, he's running the uh, 
the National Senatorial uh, Republican Committee. Uh, he's in charge of trying to make sure Republicans get a majority in the Senate next year. Uh, so he gave a speech. He he uh, was very clear that he thinks Tim Scott, who spoke on Sunday, mm-hmm. uh, he's clear that Tim Scott will probably win in the landslide. It's actually one of the things he said about the upcoming race. Safe to say um, that, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we had Rince Priebus, the former chief of staff to Donald Trump and former RNC chairman. He uh, uh, he said early in his speech, I'm going to get this out of the way. Mm-hmm. The odds of President Trump running for re-election in, two, in 2024 are 100%. That got some applause from the crowd. Uh, some people who were very uh, loud about it. Uh, some people even stood up and, and applauded, um, which was really, really interesting because when, uh, when my colleague Dale Shoemaker and I spoke to some attendees, some people did not exactly want Trump to run again, but they wanted him to help in the background. Mm. Uh, the the party should embrace his ideas, but he probably should stay uh, uh, off the ballot uh, because he uh, could be toxic. But there's also some people there who think that Trump is the only one who could uh, who could uh, help the help the country. So there, there's still a split of who should uh, lead the party uh in the next couple of years. Interesting, yeah, especially when you're looking at that, <clears throat> the role that the, the state party wants that convention to play going forward in terms of, you know, obviously the first in the South primary, so they kind of want to get a jump on that whole nomination process too, and just the role that they're trying to carve out there uh, with a convention like that. But Joe, you also heard, uh, Joe, you also heard from Senator Tim Scott, who's running for re-election too. You guys even caught up with him after uh, the event to kind of get some idea about what his future is looking like. Obviously, he's running for his his final Senate uh, campaign right now. Uh, he's he has no real challengers at this point. He has a Democrat, Crystal Matthews, who's running against him at this point too. But what did he say about his future beyond that race? He uh, he got the he got the question during a Q and A with uh, people. Who are in in uh, who are in attendance, and he said he's concentrating on 2022. Uh, he, he thanks God. He's very thankful for people uh, talking about 2024. But he said there may be a surprise candidate that's coming back, surprise return candidate that's coming back again, hinting at Donald Trump. And uh, reporters did follow up with him afterwards and asked if Trump ran ran would he run? And Tim Scott said no, he would not. He would support President Trump. Uh, if President Trump decided to jump back in. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Similar to what we heard from former Governor Nikki Haley, too, there. Yeah, it's there. Uh, people are, uh, these potential candidates are kind of aligning themselves with Trump. They don't want to uh, 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 appear to be against him running again, because at the end of the day, their their, te- their chances may be tied to uh, having his support if he decides not to run. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and Joe, looking at um, SCGP Chairman Drew McKissick, he had some opening remarks there talking about unity in the party, which is interesting because you're talking about people who you know want to support Donald Trump and those who think he's toxic, uh, and then you're in Horry County, which is just a huge uh, melting pot for a lot of this rhetoric, a lot of these ideologies, um, especially because the party itself in Horry County is somewhat divided from the state party. We're looking at some people like uh, Executive Committee Woman uh, uh, Tracy Diaz, who kind of said that she felt slighted by the state party with this whole situation going on, broke away and actually had their own separate convention a couple miles south, a couple miles away from that one that was going on with the state GOP. Uh, and she, you know, Trace Diaz, she's an early promoter of QAnon conspiracy theories and a lot of different rhetoric going back and forth between Horry County GOP and the state GOP. So what was going on right there with that other rally at this weekend, this past weekend? It- it was definitely interesting. Now, uh, again, yeah, Drew McKissick said it's important that we be unified. Rick Scott said it's important that we are unified and we're going to be unified against Joe Biden. And that's where uh, that's the one thing that could unify us. Is we're all against Joe Biden and Joe Biden's policies. Um, what happened at the other conference is a, is a good question. They were they were charging people to get in, mm-hmm. uh, including journalists, and charging media. Yeah. charging journalists to get in, which is a hard sell for us who, when we have uh, such uh, not, we have limited budgets. Mm-hmm. And, um, it, it's, it's Most of us were unable to go and attend that conference. Uh, uh, I, I know state representative Jonathan Hill was scheduled to speak, but uh, it, it was definitely interesting how they had this all alternative conference and at the other end of the of the grand strand we had the scgop saying it's important that we be unified um 
how that conference went, well, <laughs> we're not sure. We're yeah. still waiting to see uh, what kind of releases they put out on, on it. But Joe, it's interesting that we're talking about unity, and then you're also in the 7th Congressional District where you know, Republican Congressman Tom Rice, who voted against we voted for President Trump's impeachment this go around in January after he, you know, incited the January 6th insurrection, uh, who's now drawn, I think, 15 challengers to challenge him in this race for the 7th Congressional District. He wasn't invited to that SCGOP convention. Uh, what, what's going on? What's the state of play? What did you hear from folks about that, that ongoing primary battle right now for Tom Rice's seat? I think there's one thing to be clear also to, to clarify. The, the SCGOP didn't invite Tom Rice, but they also made sure no one who was running for that seat actually got speaking time. When okay. anyone had a flyer from uh, another candidate had a flyer that was being distributed, the SEGOP did not want it distributed. There was a candidate who was running who tried to do an interview in front of the First in the South logo, and the SEGOP shut that down. Okay. Um, the the SEGOP is not is trying to make it look like they're not taking sides in this, but when you have fifteen candidates co- uh, uh, running for uh, the the nomination, you're going to splinter off that that angry at Congressman Rice vote, mm-hmm. and Congressman Rice may end up doing well because of it. Um, Congressman Rice leads in the fundraising, um, and so how that all turns out will be will be dependent on whether the people who are angry at Congressman Rice could actually unify around one or two candidates. Mm-hmm. A big race we'll be watching for sure, but also another big race statewide is the governor's race. Um, obviously, Governor McMaster's running for her second term, his second full term. Uh, he's drawn some Democratic challengers. What's the state of play right now with that race, Joe? Who's raising the most money, and and how's that going at this point? So, at the end of the third quarter, McMaster had raised uh, three point five million dollars. I reported raising three point five million dollars for the entire cycle. Uh, Democrat. Uh, candidate uh joe cunningham he was at one million dollars for the cycle mm-hmm. and um state senator mia mcleod who's running for the democratic nomination she was at two hundred seventy-five thousand. so governor mcmaster um uh, is in the lead fundraising wise even though there was some difficulty last year even holding fundraisers because of covid that mm-hmm. it looks like it hasn't affected his ability to to raise money uh in the race so He's just, I mean, he can afford to sit back. There's no GOP challenger right now. So he could sit back. He could uh, save up that war chest at the moment. And while Joe Cunningham and Mia McLeod try to figure out who's going to actually uh, uh, get the nomination on the Democratic side. Mm-hmm. A lot of campaigning going on, too, at this point. So we'll be watching that as well with Joe Bustos. He's a politics and government reporter for the state newspaper. Joe, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Gavin. It was good to be here. Now, Winthrop University political science professor Dr. Scott Huffman joins me to analyze results from top races from across the country and what they mean for the upcoming midterms. Scott, welcome back. Thanks. Glad to be with you. So, Scott, let's look at these two gubernatorial races across the country uh, and how they, what they mean for the midterms coming up, specifically Virginia and New Jersey. Uh, Virginia is a state where President Joe Biden won by 10 points last year. Uh, elected Republican Glenn Yonkin with 51 percent of the vote to Terry McAuliffe, who had 48 percent. What are the ramifications of this? Obviously, it's a big, big issue this week that everyone's trying to decipher and see what it means for the upcoming midterms. Well, it's not just the, the loss of McCullough. There were three statewide offices that the Republicans picked up. Um, and the news is not good for Democrats uh, in Virginia or in the country. Basically, what it showed, a lot of the folks who voted for or Joe Biden were voting to get Donald Trump off their TV screens. Um, The Democratic Party had been looking at Joe Biden running for president since the 80s and saying, yeah, no thanks. Uh, But he was nice and safe and not Donald Trump. And so he got elected. However, then, okay, the pullout from Afghanistan, nothing else is happening. Democrats are in sort of a a malaise to to quote Jimmy Carter, ennui, whatever you want to call it. And the uh, Republicans are fired up. Now, Northern Virginia and a little bit on South Side Norfolk are the absolute keys to winning Virginia. You have to have overwhelming turnout there. The rural areas of Virginia are just the not so populated that they generally make a difference unless there's overwhelming turnout. That's what we saw. We saw fired up Republicans about the culture wars, and we saw Democrats with uh, a lack of energy. 
Yeah, and a lot of vote switching going on there too, it sounds like. Yeah, and, and you know, people split their tickets all the time. And that's, you know, not an uncommon thing. But the the Republicans may be picking up the, you know, the, the state house as well. But you did see a lot of people who voted for Joe Biden to become president and then voted for Youngkin. And a lot of those people honestly weren't voting for Joe Biden. They were voting against Donald mm-hmm. Trump. And then they voted for Youngkin. And then, Scott, we always know it's a difficult year for the party in the White House when it comes to midterms. Is this even more so a wake-up call, a flashing red light for Democrats? Oh, absolutely. you got to remember back when uh, Obama was elected, uh, gee, in the next year, Virginia went Republican. And that year, New Jersey actually also went Republican. The Tea Party movement, too, too, yeah. Um, They came darn close. And so in those next midterms, we saw a lot of Democrats being swept out of office. So they're going to have to do a lot of organizing. People are going to have to feel that the Democrats at the national level have done something to make their lives better. And they're going to have to energize the base, which at this point is, you know, in a a lounge chair with a wet cloth over their head resting, apparently. (laughs) That's quite the image right there, Scott. But when we talk about, you know, McAuliffe, a former governor there, a party insider, uh, the campaign was pretty tricky because he tried to paint Youngkin like this Trump guy. But Yonkin was running a campaign where he really walked a fine line right there. Do you see this becoming a blueprint for Republicans in, in pretty tight uh, swing districts going forward that they've kind of maybe cracked this code where they can be close to Trump in a way that they're not close to him? Well, and, you know, what, one instance may be, you know, an, uh, an exception, but it looks like he did a pretty good job of sounding and acting like Trump, saying absolutely everything to fire up the Trump base the classic culture war, uh, talking about critical race theory, which has never been taught in an elementary school or high school ever. It's only ever taught in um, uh, law school, and it's not what people think it is anyway. But that fires people up, but not having Trump by his side. So don't alienate those swing voters. That is a blueprint. You fire up the hardcore Republicans, but you find a way to not put Trump's face in front of the swing voters who voted for Biden. Mm-hmm. Scott, kind of switch to, you know, looking at the Democrats and this being kind of a ding at them. Uh, you know, uh, was this a pretty big rebuff of Washington to Democrats right now? We we're talking about the progressives versus the moderates, we're talking about these infrastructure bills that some say, I think uh, Senator Tim Kaine said, you know, if we would have passed this in August, this infrastructure bill or the spending bill, we could have seen Terry McAuliffe running with all these things that will be coming to their way in Virginia. But instead, it's just been back and forth, and that's been the dominant headline right now. Uh, you even had House Majority Whip Jim Clyburn kind of saying that I'm not too sure that Democrats have yet developed the will to win in 2022. So this is also a pretty big slap against Democrats just really being inactive, it seems like. Well, there's always the, you know, the, the classic trope used about Democrats is that it's, it tends to be a circular firing squad that you know, they're basically taking each other out of contention by nitpicking. The, the tent is a big tent. The Republican tent is much more concentrated, much more uniform in its ideology. The Democratic tent is full of people who, whose ideologies are frankly pretty far apart on some things. You know, they did this, they barely got Obamacare passed before they got kicked out of office mm-hmm. because they dragged their feet. Now, whether or not getting an infrastructure through early would have made a difference. We'll never know. But the the truth is, Trump and the Republicans were pushing for large infrastructure investment, much like this at the time. Um, But it's come down to negative politics, negative partisanship. My your side must lose for my side to win policies be darned. And the Democrats are fighting over themselves, uh, you know, inside their conference rooms while they are leaving the, the candidates for 2022 out to dry. Well, do you think um, Senator uh, Joe Manchin from West Virginia, the Democrat from West Virginia, do you think he's kind of maybe become more of a voice of reason as a result of these results? Do you think that well, we're going to see some movement now on in these infrastructure bills? Like, a, again, another wake-up call that things should have been done months ago? I wouldn't, I wouldn't say a vote of, of a voice of reason. It's, uh, it goes to what in pol- political science we call the median voter theory, mm-hmm. right? And so the median voter theory in political committees in Congress is that the policies of the median voter are the ones that get passed because they're the ones whose tipping point goes one way or another. You know, in the Supreme Court, 
the you know it wasn't so much the Rehnquist court when when Rehnquist was here as as much as it was Sandra Day O'Connor's court during those years because she was the tipping point there. So it's not so much that Manchin somehow having a, a voice of reason that no one else understands. It's that his position makes him absolutely critical at this particular juncture. Mm -hmm. You think we'll see some some movement now because of all this on these infrastructure bills, at least? If, if the Democrats don't light a fire under themselves and their base, then, you know, they deserve every uh, shellacking they're going to get in 2022. <laughs> it better be a wake up call for them. And Republicans are figuring out how to take them out. And they're doing a good job at it. Coming this close in New Jersey, mm -hmm. three statewide offices in Virginia, they, they did an amazing job. And would, uh, Scott, when we go from Congress to the issues, we know you just mentioned critical race theory, education becoming a big issue in Virginia in that race and the governor's race there. Uh, the messaging was all for McAuliffe and then right on for Yonkin. Uh, what, was, what, what do we see about these issues? I mean, was it also a, a slap to Biden or was it more about the Republicans getting their messaging down on these issues and controlling the conversation? Like you said, critical race theory, which isn't even taught in public schools in Virginia, became a dominant mm -hmm. issue. Uh, yeah, it's it was it was a test run for these issues, these culture war issues. This is exactly what we're going to see in 2022. Um, critical race theory is as follows: In law school, you should examine a law passed to see if it has a disparate impact on one race or the other. That's it. Um, you know, back the Democrats in the early 20th century passed laws in the South saying you had to pass a literacy test. It didn't say that black people weren't allowed to vote. But the way it was used was to keep black people from voting. So critical race theory would say, let's take a look at that law. That's it. Mm -hmm. um, what people think is critical race theory is something different, and it really doesn't matter. You're right. The Republicans have, have figured out which flags are going to send the best signals to their voters. Um, and it was successful in this year, in 2021. And they've now got a roadmap for 2022. And if the Democrats can't have something to show that they've made voters' lives better and to undermine the, the culture wars that the Republicans are going to bring, they're just going to be in trouble. And, and talking about trouble, you mentioned New Jersey with Phil Murphy, the Democratic in incumbent, who actually won re-election. That's the first time any incumbents won re-election in that state since the 70s. Uh, how surprised were you by just how close that race was in that, in that blue state? I mean, is it still a blue state at this point? Well, I, you know, honestly, I, I wasn't that surprised that it was close. I actually thought that New Jersey was going to tip um, mm -hmm. and, you know, and it almost did. So, you know, seeing what was coming, looking at the trends of the polling, it was absolutely clear that this absolutely was going to be close, but very easily could have gone Republican. I mean, the polling in the, the Virginia race, was extremely good. Unfortunately, the way it was reported on was not necessarily as good. You know, it was things like, you know, McCulloch retains a small lead. Okay, in the poll, he was one and a half points ahead, and there was a three-point margin of error. No, that race is a toss-up. So if you watch the trends, it went from McCulloch having a pretty big lead to down to literal toss-ups, and you knew at that point McCulloch had lost all the momentum, Youngkin had picked it up. So you could see this coming down the pike. And Scott, what does this mean when we look at South Carolina, Ruby Red, South Carolina? I mean, are there any takeaways for what it could mean down here? There are rarely any close, close races. The closest we've ever seen is, you know, that first congressional district race in 2018 with Joe Cunningham, then Nancy Mays flipping it back last year. I mean, anything that we're going to take away from that for folks running in 2022 here? Well, I think you're just going to see consistency about the messaging. Um, mm -hmm. Republicans ha have always been, in the modern era, always been better than the modern era Democrats at consistent messaging, um, getting their talking points down uh, so that they you know, become dog whistles uh, that a Republican voter hears and they know that it attunes them to the national things that they believe in. So. All politics are now national. Pip O'Neill's all politics are local phrase is now gone, and the Republicans are simply better at tapping into the national anger, national energy uh, in local races. We're going to see that continue in South Carolina. 
And Scott, with a minute left, uh, talking about top issues there, we're talking about education became a big one, even though the economy is also uh, one of the top rank issues. How do you see the economy playing out next year when we're looking at inflation, supply chain issues, uh, you know, Christmas delivery issues, gas prices? Yeah. Do you see that becoming maybe the big one for next year or do you, after we've seen these refined issues also come into play? No, it's, they're not going to be that huge. They're going to be the, the secondary and tertiary. Inflation is actually a report came out yesterday. It's not quite as bad as we thought. The supply chain issues are because, guess what? The economy was better than we thought, and people went from spending their money going out to eat for services to, hey, I'm buying something mm -hmm. for a, a home project. Um, and then, of course, you know, China, with its zero COVID rule at some of their ports, you know, really interrupted the supply chain. Um, you know, if the Democrats, uh, you, you know, want to tap into that, then, you know, they should just vaguely say that it started under Trump, but then say this is your chance to finally buy American, buy local. I mean, you can twist those in a way that might help you. But the big culture war things, no, those are going to be the big waving flags. Those others will be issues, mm -hmm. secondary and tertiary. A lot to look forward to in 2022. We can't wait, Scott. Thank you for your insight. That's Winthrop University political science professor, Dr. Scott Huffman. Thanks as always. My pleasure. To stay up to date with the latest news throughout the week, check out the South Carolina Lead. It's a podcast that I host twice a week that you can find on SouthCarolinaPublicRadio.org or wherever you find podcasts. For South Carolina ETV, I'm Gavin Jackson. Be well, South Carolina.